Radio.com and Odyssey.com. Portions of today's show may be pre recorded. This program is sponsored by Dave Stahl. It's time to get educated on your Second Amendment rights. Welcome to two full hours of Gun Owners Radio. Your hosts, Dave Stahl, Joe Germisi, and Michael Schwartz, will teach you about firearms, self defense, and the laws that affect your rights to keep and bear arms. Visit GunOwnersRadio.com with questions to learn how to become a sponsor of Gun Owners Radio and get involved. Together, we will win. Now here's your hosts, Dave Stahl, Joe Dramisi, and Michael Schwartz on The Answer San Diego. All right, folks, welcome to Gun Owners Radio, FM 96.1, AM 1170. The Answer. 360 CQB Jeff Johnsgard is on the line to let us know what it's all about and how you can learn too. But first, sometimes buying or selling your home can be overwhelming. That's where we are very excited to have Scott Vinson with Coldwell Banking Royalty Realty as our show sponsor. Scott is a tremendously experienced real estate broker with a passion for customer service. Scott is also a San Diego County gun owner board member and has supported our efforts to defend and restore the Second Amendment from the start. So if you're moving, let fellow Second Amendment supporter and real estate broker Scott Vinson help you sell your home and find you a new home anywhere in the United States. Just give him a call, 619-948-2459. Tell him you heard it about him on Gun Owners Radio. That's Scott, 619-948-2459. Or you can go online at scottvinson.com. That's V-I-N-S-O-N. So, Mike, how you been doing? Fantastic. Scott's the best. If you have any uh, yeah. any uh, uh, real estate needs, call him at Coldwell Banker Royal Realty. Cool. So we're going to jump right in. We're going to talk to Jeff Johnsgard from 360 CQB. Um, he's got a class coming up. He's partnering with uh, AO Sword. We're going to talk to him. Mm. My wife, Laura, is our special guest Excellent. here. Excellent. Hi. All jo- questions go to her. That's right. <laughs> Joe couldn't make it in. Uh, Joe, hope you're listening. Hope you're doing great. Yep. Yeah, and I'm your stand-in. That's right. Ooh. <laughs> So, Jeff, are you there? I am, yes. How you doing, man? I'm doing excellent. How are you guys? Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, you're, you're, gonna, you're doing a class in, uh, in San Diego here coming up, right? Uh, yeah, I'm doing several things. So, for those of you that remember, thanks for having me back on. I did a Magnum episode and uh, have been on Gun Owners Radio previous. Uh, it's been great. Uh, coming down to the U.S. because I'm a Canadian cop, so I'm coming down for four weeks and doing quite a bit, uh, five states, all the rest of it including a class uh, uh, on the October, when is it, 23rd and 24th. Uh, I could talk all about that stuff for sure. All right. Now, why should a bunch of Americans take a gun class from a Canadian? Let's yeah. start right there. <laughs> and first off, how'd you get in? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, no doubt. Well, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll answer that tongue in cheek as well. That I'm uh, just super happy to uh, be able to officially announce that David Chong of, of AO Sword in El Cajon uh, just signed on with him. So I'm going to be his lead instructor uh, for both of his facilities in in Arizona and in California. So that's how nice. I got in. And, yeah, that's how you got in. That's how they. That's how <laughs> let you. You didn't have to jump over a wall or swim across a river. You actually yeah. just. Uh, that's good. Hey, hey what's CQB stand for? Well, actually, it's CQD Delta. Uh, oh. uh, simply put, it's uh, close quarter defense. You know, ah. words have words have meaning. So CQC, close quarter combat. Typically, that's personal skills. If you want to talk military speak, CQB would be the battle, right? So that would be more like uh, units uh, and you know taking over uh, you know neighborhoods and things of that nature. Where close quarter defense is court defensible, as well as it is uh, uh, the defense of the person and the skills from that from that that upward if that makes sense it makes a lot of sense okay so how did you hook up with ao sword david chong friend of the show fantastic guy how did you guys uh, connect uh, simply put it was uh, pre-covid uh, i just happened to be doing a demo for some law enforcement uh, david happened to be there on an unrelated matter and uh, uh we just struck it off uh, that's the short version of that and, and, so and now, it uh, sounds like we're going to see a lot more of you in san diego then uh, absolutely. Yeah. Looking forward to that. So we'll be coming in, uh, as I said, I'm actually, I'm coming in October 8th and 9th. I'll be at AO Sword doing some free demos, some discussions, kind of teaching little bits and pieces of the system and trying just to get to know everybody. So I definitely want your listeners to know that, uh, Friday, so October the 8th, Friday, the October the 8th from four to six at AO Sword, yeah. AO Swords in El Cajon on main street. 
Uh, you can check them out if you go to the San Diego County Gun Owners website or if you just go to AOSword.com. And so you're going to be there when again? Uh, yeah, so as I said, uh, October the 8th, the Friday, from 4 to 6 p.m., and then again on Saturday the 9th from 10 to 12, and then again from 2 to 4. So uh, please just let everyone know that they're more than welcome to come by. We'll be doing, as I said, they'll be teaching some free sessions, just some demos and some things, getting to know people and answering their questions. So uh, uh, the first one you asked me, why would you want to learn from a Canadian? Well, <laughs> asked and answered, come on down and I'll, we'll show you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, so talk, dude, what, what makes you different, though? What kind of things are they going to learn? Um, uh, you know, and I'm just talking about your average Joe uh, in San Diego who's, you know, they own a gun, they, they want to, you know, be proficient, they want to be able to defend themselves. Talk about some of, the, some of your curriculum, some of the things that you specialize in or because what makes you different. Because we have a lot of training Absolutely. out there. We have tons of training. So what, what makes you stand out? Well, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking that. So uh, uh, I'll answer your question two, in two parts, I guess. Normally, I'm training military and law enforcement, uh, and there's certain things that we go about doing that gets really great increases in their performance. Uh, but and that, that easily kind of crosses over into the civilian world, uh, not because it's a, a different mission, but I guess it kind of is. What I mean is that, uh, you know, the buzz terms of, you know, we're using out of learning, we're decreasing the cognitive load by the, the certain words we use and the techniques and things. So really, it's a matter of understanding that if you, if you give me a chance to show you, you're going to train less, but at, at a much higher degree of level. Uh, and, and it's simple to do so. You know, it's, it's well established in sport and motor learning, for example, that, uh, you know, if I had you for a few hours or a few days, I could get you performing at a certain level quite high. But then after an interval, after a little time passes, your skills are going to dramatically fade. Now, I could train you. I could go back in time and initially train you slightly differently, which is not intuitive. Um, uh, we can certainly easily show you how to do that. Um, it actually is more uh, small bits of practice, 15 minutes at a time, so to speak, uh, but in a certain way. Now, at the end of that training, again, those hours or those days, you're going to be performing at maybe a slightly less level than you would with just that chunk of practice. But after a time period, which is what, of course, we're talking about, right, when we need those skills again, you're going to perform at a much higher degree and level. So as we know that, uh, uh, you know, it's not just about motor learning, which is just fancy words for saying the, the skills themselves. So when you've got people who are just like every, everyone else, right, super busy, got family, got a job, a little bit of training time and a little bit of training money to put in that time further uh, to get a higher degree of uh, skill level after that that's what we specialize in and i can articulate that further but just come on down and i'll i'll, I'll literally give it to you for free you know as a, a taste of it on the eight to nine what does that mean decreasing the cognitive load well so just imagine that um Words have meaning. Uh, so if I were to say a tactical reload, which is kind of the buzz terms in the firearms community, what the heck does that mean? An emergency reload. Well, no offense, but I'm in a gunfight. It's an emergency. Everything's an emergency, right? So you have to then learn what I mean by that term and link it to a selection of a motor pattern or the selection of a, of a certain physical response. Why don't we just call it a lockback reload? Why don't we just call it a retention reload? Just as a simple example, if it's a retention reload, what do you think you do with that magazine? You retend it. You keep it. So I've decreased the cognitive load on the student. Now, mm -hmm. if I can then in turn build a, a richer mental model or just your mental representation for what the heck you're doing with this motor pattern. These are all – it's kind of funny because it's the exact opposite. My describing it to you is more effort, right? Is more is harder to understand. It's the, it's the exact opposite of what I'll do when I'm training you. But uh, well, I'll tell you this, Jeff. way to explain it. I actually have really Go good ahead. news for you. My wife's in the studio here, and she's nodding her head yeah. yes mm -hmm. in agreement. I am. And she's very, very, very hard on trainers. So if you're getting some, <laughs> some, some positive nods from her – you're already doing something right. You know, the other thing that you're uh, doing and that I want to mention and, and let you know how much I appreciate is you're doing a class for our Not Me ladies. Oh, I can't yeah. tell you how much I appreciate that. Where do people go to get more information about your classes that are, are going through AO Sword? Uh, absolutely. Well, either on AO Sword's website or ours, mine, naturaltactical.com. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. All right, Jeff, that was great. Thank you very much. But, hey, folks, guess what? We brought Mark Miser back again. We are going to talk more about elections. All right. Mark Meiser was on last week talking about his campaign for U.S. Congress, and we got to talking about election integrity. 
which is such a hot topic right now that we're having him back. Yeah, but first, self-defense and emergencies can happen to anyone, and there is no guarantee that the justice system will be on your side. Make sure you are protected for the legal battle after your self-defense battle. And while you protect your family and property, U.S. Law Shield is here to defend you 24-7, 365 days a year, with a comprehensive self-defense coverage at an affordable price. Bad guys don't take days off, and neither does our coverage. Listeners get a free T-shirt when you use the code GUNOWNERSRADIO. Sign up today. Go to uslawshield.com. All right, Mark Mieser is running for uh, U.S. Senate here in California, and uh, we got to talking to him, and you, you can see more about his campaign and uh, what he's doing at markmieser.com. That's M-A-R-K-M-E-U-S-E-R, markmieser.com. Mark, are you there? I am here. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Uh, fascinated by your campaign, but we kind of we kind of stumbled into really more of what you do for your day job uh, at the last uh, in the last uh, interview, and it was so fascinating. I wanted to give it a ton of time. So let's. So we have two segments. We're going to ask a bunch of questions. Some of them, you know, short. Some of them uh, uh, in depth. But first. You know, I, I've been making the, the the point that you're probably the number one guy. There, you're at least one of the big experts mm-hmm. when it comes to California election uh, campaign integrity. Uh, integrity. Yeah. So, can you just in a few sentences tell people why would I say that? What what's your background that that qualifies you to talk about campaign integrity? Well, uh, for about the last ten years, I have uh, been doing election integrity. Uh, work with elections. In 2016, I was uh, I was in Michigan and Wisconsin for the 2016 recount. In 2018, when uh, we had the Democrats just absolutely, you know, obliterate the Republican Party, I was, you know, in San Diego uh, for about 14 days, and I was in Riverside County for about 12 days you know, watching and observing the entire process and trying to maintain the integrity in some very, very close elections that came down the line. And in 2020, I was in uh, the state of Pennsylvania uh, monitoring the entire hotline there uh, when the state of California decided to take Donald Trump off the ballot uh, because he wouldn't show his tax returns. Uh, I was called to represent three taxpayers. And it, and it goes uh, on and on. There, you have a ton of experience, and, and you're a, an attorney by trade. Uh, you specialize in this. Uh, what I want to make sure people understand is you're not just a guy with some theories. You're not somebody who you know has an underground blog and, and you know all his research is what he can find on, on Google. My wife would phrase it, you're the toppest guy. You're not just the top, you're the toppest the guy toppest. out there. So um, I, I would I would I would say that there are other people probably who have more knowledge than I do, but I I I, I will hold my own with almost everybody out there. We'll we'll say that. Fair enough. So here's what I want to know. Is there and we're gonna talk about election fraud and we're gonna talk about election suppression, right? Those are those are kind of the two yes. and, and we in from your experience, what you've seen officially, not your uh, not your your theory, um, but what you know, what you've actually seen and, and can prove and, and have, have seen that sort of thing. How big is election fraud in California, meaning people who don't exist that are voting or people who do vote, their ballots get destroyed? How big a problem is that in California? I, I probably my best guess is a half of half to one percent half of one percent of 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 all the votes out there maybe half of a percent were 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 truly fraud yes okay Uh, okay 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 so i gotta throw my two cents in here what about voter manipulation now i i've seen reports that the voting machines that are being used are easily hackable they're easily I mean, you can manipulate those things like crazy. Did you see anything in that, or do you feel like you have confidence in the voting machines that we use in California? When I have personally watched them audit the machine report, I have not seen anything that uh, 
you know, where they, they literally take all the machine counts and they, and they recheck them against what the person actually voted. I have not seen any problems with the machine in the state of California in what I have personally observed. I haven't seen anything. So going back to what you said the last time, and Michael will be shocked that I remembered this, your attitude was we just didn't get out and vote. Well, let's we're going to get to that. Let's okay. really, really hammer voter integrity as okay. far as fraud. Um, so, because I really want to make sure people understand this. Now, Mark, you're a Republican. You're actually heavily involved in the Republican Party, right? Very heavily. Very heavily. So it's not like you know, listeners out there, uh, you know, can say, "Oh, well, this guy's some, well, he's not a Democrat. Let's he's not some way. Democrat, yeah, or he doesn't right. care." I mean, you know, the narrative, uh, part of the narrative, narrative out there. Um, that that is uh, by uh, Republicans. I think it's more predominantly by Republicans. Is that Republicans are getting uh, screwed in the elections because of voter fraud? And here you are, somebody that would benefit you if that were happening. You, that would be a benefit to you because you're trying to get ele- uh, Republicans elected. You're a Republican who is trying to get elected. This is something that you do for a living. But what you're saying is, hey, look, you know the the real the real thing is, you know that yes. We should always be vigilant and we should pay attention closely and make sure that everybody's vote is counted and that if you don't exist, your vote's not counted. And if you're, you, you do vote by, by mail, it's, it's, it's not thrown away. Like That's all important and we should pay close attention to it. But in your real-world experience as a heavily involved Republican, it's just not happening so widespread that many or really any, um, or I should say very few, I don't want to I don't want to do big huge absolutes, but very few, if any, um, elections are swayed by true voter fraud in California. Is this all, is everything I just said accurate? I would agree with that statement. Okay. So it, 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 if it, that's if that's not exactly happening, Mark, what is the most important thing? people should know about voter fraud before we get to voter suppression what's the most important thing that people should know about voter fraud preventing voter fraud making your vote count that sort of thing what's the most important thing voters should know in california in your opinion and should do okay the biggest problem in california elections is that the secretary of state and the registered voters are not doing their job of cleaning the voter roll so that way, when people move or people die, or actually even when uh, somebody gets married and changes their last name, uh, the register of voters is creating bloated voter rolls. And that the problem is that we all think in a day of big data and everything like that, the register of voters are cleaning this up. And unfortunately, we get these bloated voter rolls. So that, you know, some and, – and, well, most of the time, it's a no harm, no foul. We, we all see it. You know, somebody moves out of the state, and all of a sudden there's a ballot comes to them, and it gets tweeted out. Or, you know, my grandpa has been dead for 15 years, and look at this. Or, you know, someone says, you know, I got married seven years ago, and all of a sudden I got a ballot in my main name and a ballot in my – Real name, and look, there's two different things. I could have easily voted twice. And so the biggest problem with California elections, in my opinion, is the Secretary of State and the Register of Voters are not doing their job to properly use big data to ensure that there's integrity in our election where only those people who are eligible to vote are registered to vote. But if there's not a fraud issue, why would blo- would bloated voter rolls, why is that a problem? If there's if there really isn't a widespread fraud issue, then why would a bloated uh, voter roll matter? What does that do? Well, that that is where the fraud takes place. You know, because you have that. bloated voter roll, because you have bloated voter rolls, you know, that is where somebody can cast multiple elect- uh, multiple ballots. You know, maybe somebody gets two ballots, one in their maiden name, one in their real name, and the state sends them two ballots, and they they vote both and send them back. Well, by law, one person, one vote. If not, because I have a maiden name and a regular name, I get to vote twice, or I don't get to vote for grandpa and myself, you know. And so 
there are people who are unethical. There are people who like power and try to maintain power. In fact, I was just reading a story this week of, believe it or not, George Washington committing election fraud back in the 1760s. Wow. Uh, you know, he he had a position of power, and he went to the sheriff and said, Sheriff, I want you to let my friends and my family vote first. And since you had to vote out loud, it just showed that there was this overwhelming support for George Washington. And the first 15 people who voted, among them were George Washington's cousins and brothers. And the sheriff mm-hmm. basically ensured that there was this you know, by the time anybody could vote for the other side, there was already this huge gap that had already happened. And unfortunately, what happens is when people are in power, they manipulate the system to make sure that they stay in power. And when you have bloated voter rolls, uh, that is just one of the tools that can be used to uh, ensure that you get extra votes in some very close election. Okay, so what's that percentage? That, that's a, that's a part of that that half. That's that half, half percent. percent. Oh, that's the half. That's so. Right. Yeah. So if we, I guess that's kind of my question is if we solve that completely, Mark, we're really only talking about about a half a percent. I mean, we don't want that half percent to t- grow to ten percent, but you know, it's important to have have uh, have accuracy. But really, even if we solve that problem completely, we're still really talking about a half percent. Like for example, the recall. I mean, you know. The, the no recall won by like a two to one margin. They, it, that that that's half percent crazy. wouldn't have made a difference, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that's what we're talking about. Is that half percent? Yes, but what happened is because of the election irregularities or the potential of fraud, people were talking about it on social media. It was being covered in the mainstream media, and what happens is voter suppression because and, people and, and say that, okay. that mark yeah. that yeah. voter suppression we're going to hit yeah. that on the other side of the commercial because that's where this is all going that's yeah. why this is important and we have to figure out how to correct that because i guarantee you if this was going the other way and a, and a democratic state was electing republicans left and right they'd be in there with their broom cleaning this up so fast your head would swim we didn't get stared the answer no. Jeez, a little bit of a delay. Though. Give her one job, just one job. I didn't hey, want to commandeer his. I know, because he does get a little testy. When My he gosh, stomp all over him. Hey, folks, our freedom of speech is just as important as our freedom of self-defense, and we are thrilled to support an American company like My Pillow. Go to MyPillow.com and use the code Free Market Three, and get up to sixty-six percent off America's best pillow. Get a great night's sleep and enjoy the satisfaction of supporting. Companies fighting against cancel culture. That's mypillow.com and use the code free market three for up to 66% off. All right, we're talking to Mark Meiser, who's running for U.S. Senate, but uh, we're talking to him about his day job, which, which uh, has to do with election integrity. And we just talked about um, how, much, how much of a problem it is. Um, and uh, we want to roll into what the real problem is. Um, but before we actually had somebody write in, Mark, and they, they, you know, since the last election, you've had the ability to print out your own ballot. Is that a problem? Is that a solution? What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, in order to print out your own ballot, you actually have to enter in your driver's license. And because your ballot has a uh, barcode on it, they're able to, or your envelope has a barcode on it, it's, it actually. Uh, the second you enter in that you're printing your own ballot, it actually uh, vacates any other prior ballots. And so as such, it is not a is not an issue that has great uh, concern with me. I don't like it. I, I you know I, I think we're we're making this election process very confusing by having 15 million types of ballots, and it's making it harder for register voters to do their job, which, you know, when you have all the various ways to vote um, and you're opening them up to everybody, it was really designed for a system for people on nuclear submarines who weren't able to get their mail. It was, it was a system designed for them to vote. And now we're just opening it up to everybody. 
And, you know, the, the problem is it creates a lot more work for our registered voters. It takes longer to count and it creates more insecurity and causes people to be concerned about the integrity of the election. And most people don't understand the procedures behind it. But ultimately, that is one of the many things that came down in the last four months that really caused people to be concerned that their vote actually does not matter. Okay, and so and and you were saying, hey, yeah, election fraud is a is a problem. Anytime, if one person out there is is casting a fraudulent vote or destroying someone's legitimate vote, that's a problem. But it may not be the issue or the problem. Uh, the issue, the problem, a uh, much broader uh, um, problem, I guess, is what you call voter suppression. Right now, we're gun owners. Suppression, you know, we love suppressors. That's that's you know, but. <laughs> In this situation, it sounds like it's it's not as as good. Talk about why um, people's perception that voter fraud is so widespread that it's leading to voter suppression, and why that's a problem. What what happens when people think that their vote doesn't matter is they're less likely to participate in our system, whether it's they don't give. Uh, campaign contributions, maybe they don't donate their time to their favorite candidates or parties, um, or they, you know, it's just like, you know, one of the candidates running for governor actually has said, you know, I didn't even vote in such and such presidential election because my vote didn't matter because I lived in California. And I, I'm going to take us back to 2018. In 2018, I ran for secretary of state, which was the chief election officer of the state. I got 4.4 million votes. I lost by about 3 million votes, but the more telling number is 4.5 million people who were registered to vote, knew that they had a civic duty to vote, but simply decided not to vote because the Democrats were going to win anyways. And so what we are seeing, you know, even in the recall election, we, we were able to see that approximately 2 million people who voted for uh, Donald Trump in 2020 – uh, who had a ballot mailed to them at their house, decided not to even turn it in. And we're, we still have yet to figure out why they didn't, but it appears from what I'm able to gather that the reason why they didn't do it is they thought that their vote didn't matter because of voter fraud or, you know, or Gavin Newsom that was already going to win. And so the problem is, you know, I'm sure everybody in the studio here today and most of your listeners actually are going to vote. They're, they're what we call perfect voters because they are actually engaged with the system. They understand the importance of it. But the problem is they're, the vast majority of Californians just want government out of their life. They just want to go to Billy's tee ball game. They want to go to Sally's uh, gymnast meet. They want to go to school. They want to just live their lives. They don't want government involved. And when they hear stories about voter fraud, it, it is used as a justification as to why they're not going to take the time to study the ballot and actually cast their vote. So, so with what's going on right now in, in today's society, you know, with the mandates and the lockdowns and all that, is this going to make more people angry enough to vote? And second part of that question once you get into the U.S. Senate, what are you going to be able to do to correct this? Or is it even correctable as far as – because once we eliminate the fact that, no, my vote doesn't count, and some way, somehow, we've got to let people know that it it does count, what could you do? Okay. I like the second question, but to answer the first question, um, we are actually seeing some very positive signs from the recall election – that there was a lot of people who came to the polls to vote for the very first time. They hadn't voted in like the last four years, and they were registered to vote, and they showed up. And so, yes, the, what, what, what was actually surprising was all the people who just tend to vote in like the general election who stayed home, you know, uh, even though they had a ballot mailed to them. So what we saw is that there is a new group of people that are just getting upset with this government, you know, saying you're essential, non-essential, or the government mandate, and they're saying enough is enough. 
I can no longer not be involved in politics. And this is very similar to what we saw in 1994 after Hillary Clinton had tried to push social life medicine on everybody. We actually saw a lot of people kind of wake up and go to the polls to vote. And what the pollsters are kind of saying is that 2022 has the – it's looking like it's going to be a 1994 election where a lot more people come to the polls to vote. Uh, because they are just fed up. And so one of the things I'm doing as running for U.S. Senate is, yes, election integrity is a problem, but it's a problem that we could overcome if we simply get out and vote. And there are millions of gun owners in the state of California who appreciate their Second Amendment right, but for some reason or other, they stay home. And it's, and it's important for people like me to get on radio stations such as yours and remind them that if we want our constitutional rights protected, it is important that we actually exercise our God-given, not just responsibility, but duty vote. And no greater place is that important than right here in the state of California And I would say even in San Diego, with all the military bases that we have, it's important that we get ensure that uh, we get out and vote to protect the people who give us that right to vote. So I've had this idea rattling around in my head, and I haven't talked to too many people about it. I'm in television as well as radio. Why can't we allow candidates to go on television without having to buy TV time because the TV stations, they'll sell advertisement around, let's say, when you come on. If everybody knows you're coming on, TV stations sell. So you don't have to pay for TV. That way, everybody running for governor, Senate, what have you, will have free television. And then you put a cap on how much money you can spend. Because don't you agree one of the other reasons Newsom got out of this mess was because the amount of money he spent doing radio, TV, and print. Well, he definitely outspent uh, the uh, the proponents of the recall about thirty five to one. Right. So yes, it was you know he was he was basically able to message for both sides uh, pretty well. And you know, I, I have you know one of the problems you know is if there's a highly contested race. Uh, you know, the media will set up debates and allow the people to get on and debate. But what happens in California is that the the Democrat Party has said, you know, we're not going to debate Republicans because we're not going to give them equal airtime. We we just can raise more money and we're going to just buy our airtime and we won't allow them to we won't we won't we won't be accountable to the people to actually, you know, be, you know, stand up for what we actually believe in. And, you know, the media, to an extent, allows them to get away with this by not saying, well, if you're not going to show up, we're going to just give the time to the other side. Instead, the media just says, well, we don't have a controversy. We don't have a debate, you know, so we're not going to do it. But, um, but there's got to be there's got to be a way to I don't know if you'd make it a law or what have you, because we're not playing on an even playing field. Well, we're not even showing up. Well, and that too. <laughs> I mean, we're not even no, showing no, no. up. But you know, if the we problem had that, is, you th- don't we, you think people would? I don't think we need another law. I don't think we need another mandate. We need people to embrace the responsibility that they have of living in a country of the self-governed, the free. You know that that mm-hmm. embraces where government protects your liberty. We need people to embrace that uh, responsibility and show up. If you can't even show up and vote in a recall election with this governor. I mean, this was clearly an example. There, uh, Marx is as big as it gets. Uh, he's saying that, hey, fraud didn't lose this election. Mm-hmm. Um, he's saying that people didn't show up. They didn't show up, and that's so ridiculous. Right. It's another example of Republicans grabbing defeat out of the jaws of victory from sitting on their hands. It's ridiculous. Mark, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for all your time. This was awesome. Please go check out his website, markmeser.com, uh, M-A-R-K-M-E-U-S-E-R. All right. Hey, did you know law-abiding gun shops and manufacturers had their credit card processing shut down because their vendors think guns are inappropriate? 
Well, shutting down businesses that support your constitutional right to self-defense is wrong, which is why we're so excited to have 365 Glacier Payments as a 10-ring partner. 365 Glacier Payments specializes in companies in the firearm industry. So if you have a business that accepts credit cards, give them a call today so you can enjoy the peace of mind that your account won't be shut down. And also enjoy the best rates. Visit their website at 365glacierpayment.com. Ask for a free account review. And if they can't beat your credit card processing rates, they'll pay you $100. Now, do you have to sell guns? No. And- I was about to say, even if you're, if you're, would, list- yeah, if you're listening to this show and you process credit cards, no matter what your business is. You could be a 7-Eleven. There you go. Support 365 Glacier uh, because they're supporting gun owners. See, we got to add that to the script because I think that's important that people think, ah, well, you know, if you're Turner Gun right. Store, that that's the only place. It's or whatever. Yeah, you're yeah. selling lemonade. Awesome. Well, it doesn't All matter. Right. If, you, if you're accepting credit cards, call 365 Glacier and, uh, you know, get, that, that's get a good quote. That's good. How cool was that segment? What did you think of that, Laura? Oh, man. oh I liked it a lot. What did you like about it? Um, uh, well, the disillusionment of the misconception. Did it clear up any misconception? Did you, did you think there was massive fraud? It seems that way in social media. And I think that that's kind of part of the problem. He pointed that out too, right? Where if you see something on social media, we all believe it all of a sudden, like the one person who got two ballots and it's just like, well, that's it. I'm giving up that I'm not going to vote, but it was interesting that he... Well, and it didn't hurt that the media found the guy sleeping at a Del Taco with a bag of right. 300 votes, ballots. Uh, ballots. Oh, look, look, look. So you automatically think, oh, well, if there's 300 there, there's got to be 300 there, and then 5,000 here and 6,000 there. But well, one thing that conservatives like is, like, I want to see the numbers. I want to see the statistics. Right. And if the statistics are that less than 1% is fraud, then... It is about just getting out and voting. Well, you know what, though? I don't want to convince you that there's no fraud. If you're listening out there, okay, if you believe there's fraud and it's widespread, great. Keep believing that. But don't not vote. I mean, right. you don't. Ha- there doesn't, they don't have to commit fraud if you stay home. I guess that means <laughs> that your vote is really more important now than it was before. Because if you do think there's fraud... Vote they, twice. Vote. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I know. That's probably not a good idea. Nah, that was not a good idea. No. You've been so strong on not, not the fraud aspect of it. And then a, a percent? How many people are in California? Yeah, 35 million, something like that. I so forget how many voters. A percent? But. That's what? Half, half a percent. It's not even a full yeah, percent. Yeah, and that, I mean, percent. you're a banker. I mean, that's not a lot. I mean, that's not a lot. I don't yeah, it's not that. a lot. Um, it's just, that, well, it's too many. Well, yeah. Any fraud but, is too uh, many. Yeah. But if your response to. Uh, fraud is to not vote, then you're just handing them victory. And, and don't you think the Democrats are going to be hell bent in 22 and 24? They don't have to be. They well, just have to look, make sure that Republicans stay home. Well, I know, but I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I hear you. If you're on that I'm fraudulent still... train, I mean, if you because right now, I mean, you know, if you look at the if you look at the the ratings of of the president and and the vice president and where they're at. They're going to have to work really hard to get their side, which is not difficult. They, for one thing, you can give the credit to the Democrats. They could awesome get awesome ground game. Awesome ground game. They get well, together like nobody's. And business. I was about to, the next part of that. Okay, so maybe people out there are listening and they they're saying, "Hey, I voted, so it's not me. He's not talking to me." Well, the next step on, of on that is you got to find ten people. Everybody's got to find ten I people know. and make sure ten people that weren't going to vote and make them vote. Don't go find ten people that are already going to vote. Uh, fi- if you find ten people that were already going to vote, make them find ten people that aren't, aren't you know that weren't going to vote and make sure they vote. You, you know, know how many I, people are afraid to even talk politics nowadays? Mm-hmm. They don't even want to bring it then, up. Then, <laughs> the, then we lost. I, I, I totally then we agree. Lost. Now so, we have another. We don't have to wait for uh, for next year. We don't have to wait for 2022. We don't have to wait for 2024. There's an election going on right now. San Diego County gun owners endorsed Laura Lothian in La Mesa. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is absolutely a winnable race, but it's also a losable race. If everyone stays home and says, "I'm not going to do anything," or "Gee, I'm sure someone else will do something," mm-hmm. uh, then we're going to lose. Well, and I think that's the bellwether. Is we sit these people to sit home. Maybe they're not voting, and if the Democrats l- win again, then they then it's easy for them to say, "Oh, well, sh- that's it," you know. Well, and what about what about the one in West Virginia with McCullough? Right. Yep. No. Well, but right here, right now, yeah, November second, right. there is an election. 
San Diego County Gun Owners endorsed Laura Lothian. If you right. go to Laura for La Mesa, Laura, F-O-R, LaMesa.com, right. you can donate. You can sign up to help her. If you look at our emails, um, we're going to have all kinds of opportunities to to help her, but mostly let's get a couple bucks in her coffers. Now, that's just La Mesa, right? It's, well, it, you can live anywhere. You can live anywhere and donate to a candidate running oh, La Mesa. Oh, okay, okay. But you to can like live, me in Alpine, I, it won't, I won't get a ballot. You won't get a ballot, but anyone, Alpine, anywhere in San Diego, you can go and help her win. Right. You can donate to her. You can uh, get her people to bucks. vote. If you know anybody in La Mesa, um, you know, tell them to vote. I mean, you know, this is I'd how it's supposed to work. I'd go to the Chase Bank, but it's not there. Yeah, really. <laughs> this is how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to uh, care about who in yeah. your community is running for office and whether or not they win. Yeah. How many times do we need to be slapped in the face until we finally figure out that it's as simple as going down It's not fun vote. anymore. No, it used Getting to be. Getting smacked in the face yeah, used to, know, used it's to kind be of fun, fun right? Yeah, First of. couple times. But. Yeah. But now it just hurts. Yeah, now it's just yeah, and, now it, and it's really starting to hurt. Yeah, now I'm going ow. Well, we, now we have to start really fighting back, you know, because if we keep letting this steamroll through town, because you have said it once, you have said it eight million times. We have to start at the local levels. We do. You want to hear a cool story? Sure. Orange County had their monthly meeting last mm-hmm. uh, last week, and I went up to you know participate and help. Orange County gun owners, you guys are doing really, really great. If you're listening in Orange County, if you're listening in San Diego and you know somebody in Orange County, get involved. Orange County is really uh, starting to uh, come alive and do some really good things. So they had their monthly meeting, and uh, I was talking to um, a lady named Angela. Uh, Angela, if you're listening, fantastic conversation. Appreciate you coming to your very first Orange County gun owners meeting. We get to talking, and I, of course, bring up Gun Owners Radio. She's a fan. She's been listening to Gun Owners Radio for months. She said, oh, I recognize your voice now. (laughs) So she came to the Orange County meeting. She's getting more and more involved. Angela, thank you so much for listening. It was a pleasure. Uh, I'm sure you're listening to this. If not right now, you're listening to the podcast later. Um, But uh, great job at showing up and great job to everybody in Orange County. You know, they got a new executive director up there, Steve Mills. Um, He's doing really, really well. And uh, it's it's a bright future for Orange County. We're actually going to have a really cool event in on uh, this is going to be December second. It's the first Thursday in December. Um, more details to follow, but uh, John Korea is going to come out oh, for it. It's wow. going to be a big falutin uh, holiday event, and it's going to be a whole lot of fun. So can, Orange County. Can I ask you about fun. Riverside for a moment? Because sure. a, a friend of mine called Jamie. I hope you're listening, Jamie, because I told her to, and she's interested, in not me, SD. Yep. Are you doing that program in Riverside? Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Riverside. Um, so Riverside, there is a Riverside County Gun Owners uh, pack. Okay. There's there's not me RC Riverside oh, County. Okay. Um, there's also San Bernardino County Gun Owners okay. pack. Those are two separate organizations. Right. Just announced that we're actually going to fold them into one organization. It's going to be uh, Inland Empire. Oh, that's they're, good. What's happening is they're cooperating so much and that there's so much uh, similarity and geographic uh, uh, proximity is, mm-hmm. is real close to each other, basically. You know, a lot of people that live in the Inland Empire, um, which is San Bernardino and Riverside, Riverside County, right. a lot of them live right on that I-10 mm-hmm. corridor. Menifee. Yeah, right in there. Right. So um, basically something like 80% of the population okay. is, is all in one spot. So we're going to... We're going to combine efforts and uh, roll into Inland Empire gun owners. Right. Okay. Well, because it's so all a, she has to do yeah. is if she's up in Riverside, right? Just is. go to RiversideCountyGunOwners.com, RiversideCountyGunOwners.com, okay? Because we haven't switched yet, right? And that's going to take them obviously to the Riverside County Gun Owners website. Mm-hmm. That's how technology works. I know it works really well. Yeah. And uh, there's a uh, "Not Me" button. You just click on that "Not okay. Me" button, and she can get she can get involved. It's a it's actually uh, they're doing really really and well. She was shocked when I told her the benefit of it. She goes, "What? Really? They'll they'll train me? Yeah. They'll show me? Yeah." And I go, "Absolutely," because she's she's single. You know, works on a ranch, so you know she just feels the need. And she hears me talking, you know, about the show all the time. So yeah, okay. Yeah, they'll find her training. They'll pair her up with somebody who's right. experienced. They'll find her training. They'll help her buy a gun if she needs to, and they'll help her get her CCW and her California CCW. And that she was shocked about because she had no because that was her next question. So once I do this, how do I get my CCW? Well, you need it. Did you see that video of the the cougar? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Not the the older woman. Yeah, the older woman. No. <laughs> It's not what we're talking about. Or um, the alligator in the trash can. I saw that. Ah, you would jump right in there, wouldn't you? No, no. Well, 
this guy was out hiking. A he was confronted by a mountain lion, Whoa. cougar mountain lion, yeah. um, and was like yelling at this thing, "Hey, stay away from me! Stay away!" From me. He had his camera up so that you could see the the you know his point of view, and he had his Glock pointed at this thing, and this mountain lion. Said, t- I don't think I showed you this, Laura, because you would have started crying. This mountain lion, she loves cat. cats. I know. This mountain lion lunged, attacked this guy, and he had to defend himself. And unfortunately, had to had to take out the cat. The, he, he felt so horrible. He sat there for a while and said, "I can't believe I had to do that." That's I, but mm. he had to defend his life. This I don't know. This, this I don't know. Wow. Seventy, eighty pound mountain lion. Wow. Uh, it's huge. Hey, by the way, Laura, over bigger? 100 way, yeah. Well, the next time your cat, hey, the big. next time your cat lunges at my make sure yeah, he doesn't have draw. a lock. I'm going to draw. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to draw down on Yeah, well you won't make yeah, it on my own. Wait a minute, Stephanie. there's somebody else who's a gun owner in the home. Yeah, and you won't make it to Thursday. I'm here to tell you. <laughs> Cuz the other cats will jump on you too. That's right. Then you'll just be outnumbered so, by So get your CCW. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this is your reminder that the Second Amendment is for everybody. But first, PRMI Mortgage, primeres.com slash alpine. Are you uh, in the military? Are you looking help on a VA loan? Or maybe you're just looking to buy, refi, or even consider a reverse mortgage? Give our local mortgage guy a call that you can trust. Chris Wiley at PRMI Mortgage. For nearly 25 years, Chris has been helping local San Diegans with all their mortgage needs. Call Chris at 619-722-1303 or just go to primeres.com slash alpine. I called him to do a reverse mortgage, and he said no. Why would he say no? He can't make any money if he says no. Because it wasn't good for you. Exactly. All right. Hey, who's our next guest online? So one of the coolest things that I've seen in the gun industry, you know, in the last five years is the uh, the, the broad appeal that firearms ownership has, has really taken on. Mm-hmm. I mean, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there was a very specific stereotype. There wasn't a lot of diversity. Um, you know, mostly men, old mostly, crotchety ex-military. Yeah, pay, we we call them pale, stale, and male. <laughs> old white guys. Okay, all complaints. One in here, Mike. One in here. Pale, Mike. stale, and male. Um, truly, especially in the last few years, we've seen a wide variety of people. And Recoil Magazine. If you <laughs> are not uh, subscribed to Recoil Magazine yet, that's San Diego County Gun Owners. That's our favorite magazine. If you're a ten ring member, you get a free issue. Check them out at recoilweb.com. They're a fantastic Second Amendment gun magazine. They just did a very cool article on Elena Hicks. Elena is our our guest, and the world may know Elena better as Bonnie Rotten when she was an adult film star. But Elena is now a gun owner and is getting into the world of competition, and she's joining us here today to talk about it. Hi, Elena. Hey, Mike. How are you? Fantastic. How are you? I'm doing awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me. You bet. You're on and the what a fabulous introduction. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad. So you're actually on the air here with my wife, Laura. Hello. Hi, Laura. And, and I'm his son, David. <laughs> Hi. So let's How's talk. How's everybody doing? Fantastic. So well. And uh, congratulations on the article with Recoil. I thought it was really, really Thank well you. done. I, what, what did you think of the uh, of the final product? I was so excited. I actually kind of cried a little bit because... You know, I spoke to Ian, and they approached me about the project, and I was like, yeah, I would absolutely love that. What do you guys have in mind? And we aligned our visions together, and it came to life. We, They put me um, on an interview with a girl who wrote everything up, and she wrote everything up, like, exactly how I really wanted it to get out there. And the photos turned out amazing. The response was amazing. I literally couldn't have asked for a better uh, in product. So how did you know Ian and Recoil? How did they how did they find you or what was the catalyst there? So I actually am friends with a guy who's an editor for another gun magazine and we are friends on Instagram and he does stuff for Recoil sometimes. And he just hit me up one day and he's like, hey like Recoil wants to talk to you and I was like, oh really? And I was like, that's cool. And he's like, yeah, here's Ian's number, call him. That's cool. You know, I, I really like Recoil. I refer to them as they're like the GQ of gun magazines. And, That's uh, accurate. And yeah. It, well, occasionally they actually some of their some of their staffers uh, correct me and, and say that no, uh, GQ is the Recoil magazine of uh, for men. You know, so yes. it's uh, you know. <laughs> anyway, what uh, high quality, great photos, great writing, really fantastic. Yeah. 
But what did what did, what attracted them to you? What why did they write about you? What was the story? Tell everybody what the story kind of centered on. So the story centered on the fact, like of course, like I'm from Ohio. I moved to California ten years ago, and I was in the adult industry from 2018 to 2000 and, or 2014 to 2018. Sorry, and um, yeah, I basically retired from that, and I had my daughter in 2016, and. I was pretty much like in the entertainment world. So you guys understand like how most of the entertainment world thinks here politically in Hollywood and whatnot. And I wasn't necessarily a gun advocate in the beginning. I had been around, I'd shot guns. I didn't grow up with guns like in Ohio at all. Like my grandfather raised me and they were never in my household. It was never a thing for me. So I kind of had that unknown fear, you know? So when I was going on the road and I was dancing at clubs, I was actually a frequenter at a club in Denver, Colorado. And the people at that club, they had a bunch of guns. They were by a range. So they kept taking me to the range every time I would go out there. And I started to warm up to it. And I actually saw the beauty in the gun industry during COVID because I was locked inside and all of this political stuff, I mean, it kind of kind of blew the lid off of like anything that I ever thought before. It made me really take a look at politics and make my own decisions for myself, not centered on like, you know, a a majority idea of what the adult industry kind of had. The more, I don't know how to explain it. I guess, um, like their yeah, po- liberal, their, their, their liberal poli- standpoint on everything and, and pretty conservative, like not conservative when it comes to guns, very against guns. So, you know, that surprises I me, though. I, I can definitely see, you know, why the adult industry wouldn't be conservative. That seems kind of, you know, opposite ends of the of the spectrum. But when it comes to, you know, rights and liberty and safety, exactly. that seems like it'd be right in their wheelhouse. Yeah, the protection so aspect. That's what, yeah, that's what it yeah. kind of switched me, too, because I was like, I was always such a big proponent of, like, hey, like, our First Amendment is extremely important. Like, censorship, all these different things that we deal with. It's not exactly fair as long as we're being like, you know, uh, like concerned about who we put our content out there to, like not, you know, allowing children, all that kind of stuff to see it, but being not being censored 100 percent on social media, like what started to happen a couple of years back. And so I started I started actually speaking out against that and realizing like, OK, if they're coming out of our first if they're coming after our First Amendment, they're going to come after our Second Amendment. And it all goes hand in hand. So now, as an advocate of the Second Amendment, I realize without the Second Amendment, we can't have the First Amendment. You know, it kind of surprises me. I I thought that, or maybe it's both, but I I was thinking that your interest was going to be a little bit more uh, having to do with with protection. You know, you want to be able to protect yourself. But it sounds like your primary interest was really more of a a, a political motivation. Is Is that accurate, or were they kind of both at the same time, or...? Well, I mean, I started training, and I felt like the first day I went to the range, like after just like traveling and doing that for fun or whatever, the first day I went, I went to the actual range to train, I fell in love with it. That was last year, almost to the date, and I went to Terrence for the first time, and I was like, this environment is really cool. This is not what people think it is. This is not like you know, this like scary macho thing that women can't be involved with. I saw women that were shooting that were glorified. And for me, I'm like, that's everything that I would love to be welcomed for my talent, not for my looks. So, so, so Elena, so, yes. so, so Elena, so let me, cause, cause I gotta be honest with you, the way I looked at it, I looked you up extremely attractive. So my first thought was you know because you're traveling around town or cities and states and you're doing your show at different areas i doubt you had an entourage with you you know big burly guys protecting you i would assume that that maybe you had run into a situation at at one of your appearances to what puts you in a position where you say hey man i gotta get some safety i gotta get some training did that ever come into this at all or did you just uh, kind of morph into it because of the way these people took care of you and took you to the range? I mean, I had people that were at the clubs that would kind of guard me, and they uh, did, some of these people did carry. Okay. Yeah, okay, so, gotcha. But then when I wasn't in their vicinity, like if I'm at the hotel and yeah. stuff, there was fans and stuff that actually have come to my hotels uh-huh. and, oh, like, 
have the front desk call me and be like, hey, we're, you know, this person downstairs, you know them. That's and scary. I'm like, absolutely not. Whoa. So we're talking to Elena Hicks, better known as bon- uh, Bonnie Rotten, uh, about a recoil interview, and we're going to talk to her more after the commercial. Hey, we are proud to partner with the National Seal Carry Association as a 10 ring partner. NCCA exists to serve the Second Amendment community by providing a nationwide network of two-way advocates. They offer elite self-defense and concealed carry training from the nation's top instructors. They provide rock-bottom prices on the best selection of gear and accessories. Join them today. Members get great prices and free shipping. Learn more about them at National Concealed Carry Association. Dot com. Okay, we're talking to Elena Hicks, better known as adult film star Bonnie Rotten, about her journey into gun ownership and, and really gun advocacy, don't you think, Elena? Absolutely. So what what's it like being in the entertainment industry in L.A., in California, in 2021, and being pro-gun? Well, I've definitely lost a lot of my following. I Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Talk about that. You've, you've lost, like, fan. When you say following, you're, you're talking about fans have actually said, hey, you're pro-gun, I'm out of here? Oh, yeah, 100%. And actually, it's gone as far as Instagram completely shadow banning my account. So people can't e- I have 2 million followers on Instagram. People can't even find my profile on Instagram. What's your profile? Because Give your profile out right now so people can go on Instagram and follow you. It's at official Bonnie Rotten. And so I used to have at least 60,000 likes on a photo, like 30 low. I now am getting 2,000 to 3,000 likes per photo. And that, that's any photo or, or just gun any photos? Any photo. No, no, no. Any photo. I've tested it. And that's because of your position? Yep. Jeez. So wow. if, I was, if I were still just posting like scantily clad pictures i wouldn't be an issue but if i were posting guns boom they've they've pretty much tanked my entire engagement oh my god you have a brain that's who would have thought right oh and by by the way by the way i do have to thank to congratulate you the you were the avn award for female performer of the year and i think that's huge nobody everybody needs to know that (laughs) thank you congratulations okay so we that's so. That's a bunch of people on on the internet. What about in person? Like you know, friends or you know, when you when you came out as a gun owner, um, you know, it's a lot harder for people to uh, say things to your face, you know, or, or, or interact with you in person. Did, did you have any negative consequences in person? Well, I've actually had family members that I don't really speak to now. I, because you're pro gun. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I hope this doesn't come out wrong, but you were an adult film star, and and right. and and they you were they were close family members, and yeah. then you said, "Hey, I want to own a gun because it's my right, and I want to be safe," and they rejected you. Yep. What are your thoughts on that? How does that make you feel? Uh, I feel like it's pretty hypocritical, honestly. I mean, it, it just tells you where society's going. Yeah, we all know where it's going, and it's a round trash yeah. can. So how yeah. do, now? Do you so you, you you purchased firearms? You trained with I think you said Taryn, right? Taryn Tactical. Yep. And how many? What, and then I, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say. Well, go ahead. What, so I went there and I was like, okay, this is so much fun. I immediately two months later jumped into competing in Southern California. <laughs> wow, that's, that's I've never really shot before. So think about like me. Like, I'm kind of lanky. I'm, I'm like an awkward deer with a gun in my hand. And I'm trying to, so hard to be safe and not get DQ'd from competition. It was so funny. <laughs> How did you do? Um, in the beginning, not very good at all. What kind of competition? Was it a was it three gun or what kind of competition was it? So I started in IDPA. Mm-hmm. And that's where you have to wear like a fishing vest. You have to reload okay. behind cover. You're shooting behind cover. Um, there's like a certain round count for whatever division you shoot. Um, there's rules based on whatever division you shoot for what kind of gun you can have. So I started with my um, Glock 19 Combat Master. Yeah, there, t- that Taryn's big on that Combat Master, isn't he? How, how does that thing shoot? It's cool. Um, and then I actually moved into shooting a CZ Shadow, which worked for me a little bit better because it's a heavier gun. Mm-hmm. And as a woman, it helps me with recoil. 
yep, my wife actually likes a CZ a lot. She uh, she doesn't have one, and it's not a, a pure CZ. It's she, the Jericho. The Jericho by Ooh, IW. Oh, my gosh. I want one of those so bad. <laughs> but I'm what, what, a converted Jew. It's such an, I want that gun so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but why can't you get one in California? Uh, because there's a roster, yes. and we are not allowed to have things that are off of the roster are on, that are not on the roster. So, correct me if I'm wrong. Last time I heard, in order to get a new gun introduced to our roster, there must be like two or three removed, right? Yeah, you have to remove. But not only that, it has to include technology that doesn't actually right. exist. So I mean, oh yeah, the the, the um, micro stamp. aren't they like micro stamps? Yes, yeah. Isn't that ridiculous? So I, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's like we can't even have Gen Five Glock. Yeah, yeah, boy, you you got into it. You've you've been in it for like a year. Yeah, you geez. know all the lingo. Yeah. You, you're you're more knowledgeable than guys I know that have been well, into this for ten or twenty years. Can't she get it oh, at home? Can they, she? I'll, I got an example. I'm on a gun show with a guy, and I think you know more than my co-host. Oh yeah, <laughs> way more than me. Are you kidding? But, I, I okay. So I immediately submerged myself. Like whenever I like something, uh, I so full into it so sounds like. Jumped, like after i did idpa i jumped right into three guns wow. so i bought a pistol a rifle a shotgun a backup for everything uh <laughs> you know it all the gear i have on my belts i have all the different you know mags i have everything you could ever think of all right all right wait a minute before okay so you have this <laughs> your cz what's your what's your rifle um, I have a Cobalt right now, but I'm actually sponsored by Sons of Liberty, so they're building me up a couple of very special pieces. <laughs> I know those guys. That's awesome. Okay, what, who, who, who's, what's your shotgun? I have a Dissident uh, KS-12. I don't even know what that. That sounds See, super she fancy. Knows I don't more even know what that is. Oh, that's, she knows more than you. A, I love shotguns it's too. An open, it's an open shotgun with a Vepra platform. Wow, he doesn't know what that I know, means. Now you're like, he don't know what that means either. <laughs> I feel that's what I thought, Elena. Elena, Elena I wasn't sure I, I was going to say it, but that's Elena, what I thought. I feel so much better because this guy <laughs> constantly outdoes me when it comes to that. But I can talk cars. Yes. I can talk cars. So, Elena, do you have? So, do you live in? Uh, do you live in a? I don't know if you live in LA County or if you want to say you live in LA County. I think you said you already said you live in LA, right? You live in LA County. Yeah, I live in Beverly Hills, actually. So, are you able to get a a CCW? Mm, well, I think I can. I just haven't applied for it yet. So we we interviewed your very sheriff. Very rare to get. Well, we interviewed your sheriff about a month ago, yeah. and we're actually. Uh, it looks like we're gonna get a little. Uh, it looks like there's some headway, not because of us. He, he I don't want to claim credit, but it sounds like your sheriff is actually coming to some of the same realizations that that, that you have maybe over the last couple of years. That hey, CCWs, guns, gun ownership, it's important. So I would encourage you to apply. If uh, we actually have a. We came up with a good cause worksheet, and I'll, I'll be sure to send it to you so you can apply. Please, I, would, I would love that. And then you report back to us so that you can kind of talk about the experience, yeah. and we can help other people. But so, what what wonderful. would be what would be important to you about carrying a gun on a daily basis? Why would you do that? So, are you guys ready for a crazy story? Yeah, yes, always. <laughs> you have no so, idea how ready I am for a crazy story. Go for it. When the recoil guys came into town, uh-huh. we all went to grab lunch, right? And we're walking through Beverly Hills, Rodeo Drive. Rodeo Drive. Heard of it? So all of a sudden, this guy comes out of nowhere, gets in my face, and starts yelling at me to show me his my eyes. To mm. show him my eyes. Show me your eyes. Show me your eyes. And I'm like, what? I'm like, get away from me. And I'm trying to back away from him. And he's like getting up in my face and I'm like, get away from me. And he wouldn't get away from me. All of a sudden, thank God there were two cops across the street at the stoplight. They immediately saw this whole thing, which was getting really weird happening. And they immediately pulled the guy over, found out that he had a warrant out and arrested him. Jeez, that's crazy. Do you think, I think you need a CCW. What do you think? Was he like? I do too. After that situation, I was like, "Damn!" Like, yeah. Was uh, he drugged out, or do you think he was just 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 a psycho? I think he was just well. So apparently, his I heard that he was like a shoplifter. Hmm. So or so maybe he was like p- yeah. planning on robbing me or something. Trying to steal your well, ass. Yeah, but see, that's free in California, up to nine hundred and ninety-five dollars. <laughs> yeah, really, so it's not really a crime anymore. Yeah. So right. where did, do politically, actually, before I ask that question, so we talked about how unfortunately some people rejected you because you decided to 
exercise your your uh, your natural right to to defend yourself by becoming a gun owner and bear arms. What, what's a good story? Has anybody uh, have you converted some of your I don't know colleagues or friends? Um, you know, has anybody you know been like, hey, you know, this is great. I'm a gun owner too. I'm so glad you're standing up and talking about it. Oh yeah, I've had you know I've explained that I've had this like negative engagement on my Instagram and stuff, but with all the negative, I've gained very legit supporters. So like this weekend. I haven't shot at my home club down in Southern California in a couple, like, months, probably. So I shot down there this weekend, and I actually won High Lady. Yay. Um, Congratulations. And, thank you. And everyone was so happy to see me. They were It, it was just like being with family again. You and know, people, you know, I've started shooting with, they welcomed me. They were amazing. These guys, like, they run the club. They took me under their wing, and they taught me the game. I got to tell you, without gun owners being weird without being yeah, yeah. like without yeah. any of that. And it was it feels really nice to like be accepted based on me being like a person and, and being friendly and being kind and being, you know, just normal yeah. over and over and over again. I see that and hear that about the, the gun owner community. You know, our organization, mm-hmm. San Diego County Gun Owners, we have all kinds of events and I watch you know, I look across the crowd and I see young and old men and women, rich and yep. not so rich. Um, you know, it's really true. It's an amazing community. I mean, is it easier? Let me ask you this. Is it easier to be a gun owner in the entertainment uh, industry or is it easier to be in the entertainment industry and a gun owner? You know what I mean? Which which uh, which group accepts you uh, more? Well, being with the gun owners, of course. Yeah. It, it really, truly. Yeah. I would think if you were in the entertainment industry, you would keep your gun en- enthusiasm to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what's your what's your goal? We have one minute left. What's your goal when it comes to gun ownership? You know, political or or your skill level? What's your goal when it comes to gun ownership? Olympic in the next shooting year team. All right. Exactly. So I want to just continue to increase my skill. I'm going to PCC Nationals for USPSA next, wow. uh, in two weeks, actually. So I'm really hoping to take something home there. Um, I'm working with FPC, and I actually am an NRA certified instructor. So for me, like I've been doing the all-women classes um, and kind of helping the women that have never shot before in these clinics become first-time shooters. So it's important for me to show that women can do this and that any, anything is possible. And I just want to encourage as many women, women as I can to to defend themselves. And we're, I'm going to reach, reach out to you, Elena, yeah. and we're going to see if we can get you a CCW, and then we're going to talk all about that. Right. Hey, and until you Thank get your CCW, you. keep your sunglasses on. We have the author Sam Lichman on the line to talk about M16s. Ooh, let's say, did you know that John Dillon is the attorney on the Miller versus a Bontus case? And Bonta. the jo- That's what I said, Bontus. Bonta. 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 Bonta to you, too. And the Joe versus Bonta case. In other words, he's working to remove. I wish he'd hurry up and get this done so I don't have to yeah, do this. Too, right? Just win the case already, John. Come on, get with the program. <laughs> but there, he's trying to save your assault weapon ban, and he's working to restore our Second Amendment rights for the 18 to 21-year-olds. And if you have legal matters that involve firearms, then you need to call John Dillon, especially if you have questions about red flag laws, red, gun registration, gun transportation, or maybe you just need to know that your guns are California compliant. Call our trusted firearms attorney, John Dillon. John Dillon specializes in California gun laws. Call 760-642-7150 or visit his website at dillonlawgp.com. Well, this is a real family show today because uh, I got my wife here. Hello. And I got my nephew, Sam Lichman, Sam the Gunman, on the line. Sam, you there? Yeah, how are you guys? And my son, Dave Stahl. Yes, how are you doing there, Sam? <laughs> I got adopted. <laughs> so Sam, everybody knows Sam the gun guy as the stump my nephew guy. Uh, Sam Lichman is my nephew, 22 years old. Uh, usually we have him answering trivia, but uh, today we're going to spend a couple of segments talking about something really, really amazing. He actually wrote a, it's like a seven or eight page article for Leatherneck Magazine. Wow. So he's yeah. an author now. He's an he's a published author now. Wow. And it was all on the, it's basically the history of the M16. Which you're familiar with. You've shot an M16. Ah, I love that gun. Yeah, and Laura's favorite. You, Mine, too. You I love, love it. ARs. You have one? Of course. Well, she has an AR. Oh, okay. Well, it's not It's not exactly not an exactly. M16. She doesn't have that 400-pound. Like no, I'm no, no, no. 
And uh, anyway, it, it came out in Leatherneck Magazine. Leatherneck Magazine is kind of, I describe it as the trade magazine for the Marine Corps. Mm. And they, uh, they uh, have published his, uh, his uh, article, and it really came out great. It was really, really amazing. I'm very, very proud uh, to talk about this with Sam. Sam, you did a great job, man. Thanks very much. So tell people about, first off, um, what made you write the article? How did that come to be? Uh, well, the the article actually started out as a script for um, an abortive uh, podcast project. Uh, it that never ended up going anywhere, but um, so so I just ended up putting this script kind of on the back burner. I left it on my hard drive and didn't touch it for about a year and a half, two years. Then some other articles fell through in Leatherneck, and they needed content. I had content, and so I spruced it up a little bit, and uh, one thing led to another, and it's in the magazine now. Well, who found who? Did Leatherneck, did Leatherneck come to you? It wasn't real hard for what? Leatherneck to find Sam. Why is that? <laughs> yeah, um, so my mother, uh, your older sister, is the senior editor of Leatherneck. She's worked there since about oh. 2007 time frame, roughly, and uh, I've been going into the office as needed pretty much since then. Yeah, like and an so internship I've another, and working there. Neck before. Yeah. I've, I actually had a feature article on the phonetic alphabet published, but this is my first piece on a directly firearms-related topic. Yeah, the phonetic, I was actually, it was really cool, the phonetic alphabet article. Was, you know, the Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, that one. He wrote that oh, whole okay. thing. It was really cool. Okay, so the M16, talk to us. What was the most interesting thing you discovered in your research when it comes to uh, the history of the M16? Because he wasn't born Where to begin, when that came uh, out. You know, with, with a rifle with such a storied history and service in the U.S. military as well as many foreign militaries, there's certainly no shortage of interesting stories. But probably one of the best is that... Uh, now, some of you may know that the, uh, the United States Air Force was actually the first service to adopt any AR-15 variant for service. And the reason for that was because Curtis LeMay, the chief of staff of the Air Force at the time uh, in the early 1960s, was at a barbecue. Sources differ whether this was a birthday party or, a, uh, or an Independence Day gathering, but it was, a, it was a backyard barbecue with many top military officials as well as a sales rep from Colt who had just bought the patents from Armalite. And the, the Colt man brought along an AR-15 and some watermelons and set up these watermelons and passed off this, uh, this space-age-looking new rifle for Curtis LeMay to try out. And after blasting some gourds, he decided, well, blasting some melons, he melons. decided yeah, that. it'd have to be a pumpkin to be a gourd. Right, right. Uh, after blasting some melons, Curtis LeMay was so enamored with the new rifle that he uh, he thought it would be the perfect thing for Air Force security re forces to replace aging M2 carbines and attempted to single-handedly place an order for a very substantial number for the Air Force. It had to go through Congress. Uh, it got tied up a little bit there, but um, airmen, Air Force airmen were the first to receive AR-15s. Yeah, it wasn't really a guaranteed. I mean, the thing is so uh, such a standard, you know, uh, piece of equipment in the military community and, and in civilian ownership now, the you know the AR pattern in general, um, but it didn't. It, it wasn't. There wasn't really guaranteed, right? I mean, this wasn't a guaranteed success. I mean, it kind of. He was shooting watermelons. Some Air Force guy was shooting watermelons. Well, I, I mean, mean it just, wasn't even you know. But you're shooting a watermelon. I mean, you could shoot a BB into a watermelon and make damage. So you would think that it would have to be. How would he know if it was going to have the the velocity and the power? You know, to, to, to do what it ended up doing. That's well, so what crazy. are some of the hurdles on the way to uh, getting this thing so standardized? Now, the, the M16, which is an AR-15 variant, was the first rifle adopted by the U.S. military that did not come from, or it was the first in a very long time, whose design did not originate from within the, uh, the military system. Uh, for a long time, Springfield Armory, not the same as the company now, the, the company called Springfield Armory has no relation to the original Springfield Armory. But the old Springfield Armory had existed for a very long time to 
lead weapons development projects for the U.S. military, but Robert McNamara led an effort to defund it with the assumption being that the private market would be able to fill the role. And it's it's a very complicated political story that uh, this is neither the time nor the place for. But uh, the AR-15 was developed by Armalite, um, a division of Fair- Fairchild Airplane and Engine Company in Costa Mesa, California, in the 1950s. They didn't really have any relation to the military. They were pretty much just a design firm leveraging the sorts of expertise in space age materials and manufacturing from Fairchild being an aerospace contractor to coming up with innovative new designs. But it turned out that the the AR-10, which was an an earlier design uh, in 762 NATO, was, it, it, it had a number of very desirable features, but it wasn't really what the military was looking for. But the military was experimenting with some new small caliber high velocity rounds uh, that actually the Army had spent a long time investigating the possibility of a smaller intermediate cartridge firing a very small bullet very fast. And it it was just sort of the time was right, the place was right, Um, Armalite had a good design, and the AR-10 lent itself very well to being adapted into the AR-15, which became the M-16. Because the AR-10 didn't actually ever, uh, was it ever officially in military service, the AR-10? The AR-10 was never in U.S. military service. They were purchased and produced under license in small numbers abroad. Um, There are a few different patterns of AR-10 that were used by some foreign militaries, including uh, the Dutch Air Force, but they didn't see very widespread adoption. It wasn't really until about the 1990s that that platform started to have a resurgence. Yeah, for example, there's really no there's no mil spec AR-10. No, there are about two and a half different uh, quote unquote standards for AR-10s. The the parts compatibility is not necessarily a given. Okay, so the the M16. Um, so how long did it take before? Um, you know, all four branches, or I guess all five branches now, how long did it take for the other branches to pick up, you know, I guess what was the, how did the rest of the military find out about the Air Force's new rifle, and why why and when did they pick it up? Well, the, it's, it's another case of sort of all the conditions were very suitable for this to happen. Uh, the M14 program was having a lot of difficulties. It, it had always been a difficult program ever since its inception. And the M14 just took a really long time to adopt. They were way more expensive and time-consuming to manufacture than had been anticipated. And the, the Army wasn't able to get enough out to soldiers in the field quickly enough. Not to mention that it wasn't exactly all that suitable for jungle warfare of, of the type that the, the Army and Marine Corps were encountering in Vietnam. Why wasn't it suitable? Uh, it's long. It's heavy. The ammunition is heavy. Uh, the wood stock tends to absorb moisture and swell, which can cause a wandering point of impact, which is uh, very, very bad. And it's designed uh, its design is more suited for uh low volume of fire at longer range uh, whereas the the type of uh the type of combat encountered in jungles is better suited for something that can produce a higher volume of fire plus it was heavy yeah, yeah, if you uh, had to do a force march and you had to carry that with your pack you would love to lose it it wasn't warfare. So uh, the the M14 was having problems. The AR15 looked pretty promising, but it was still non-standard equipment. It was a very unconventional design. And so initially it was some special forces units that began using it in country in about 1963, I believe. Um, so you, you had people whose, whose jobs it was to, to sneak around behind enemy lines and, and do all sorts of covert things, who stood to gain a lot from a much lighter, much more compact rifle that was able to uh, produce a large volume of fire and had lightweight ammunition and all, all these other desirable characteristics. Right. 
And so the, uh, the Army proper realized that this was a, a good potential replacement for the M14. They adopted it. The Marine Corps, their hand was kind of forced, and there we are. All right, we're gonna we're gonna talk. We're gonna continue this conversation about your article in Leatherneck Magazine about the history of the M16. The next second. Yep. Hey, so we're talking to Sam Lichman, Sam the Gunman, uh, who normally does our uh, Stump My Nephew uh, segment, but we're actually talking to him about an article he wrote for Leatherneck Magazine, which is the Marine Corps trade magazine. If you go to mca-marines.org, you can check out the magazine mca. Dot, or, I'm sorry, mca-marines.org. We're also going to send his article out uh, this week, so make sure to get on Gun Owners Radio's email list, San Diego County Gun Owners email list, and you'll be able to check out his article, which is the history of the M16. We were talking on, about how it got adopted, some of the hurdles. Um, let's go into a big misconception when it comes to the M16 and the AR platform in general. What did you find out? Sam? Sam? Hey, is Sam there? Okay, so while we get Sam back on the line, um, what he did find out and what the article talks a lot about is that the AR platform, especially the M16, has uh, a, a bad reputation when it comes to reliability. And the reality is there were some problems at, at, at the beginning, um, but a lot of them were, were, were solved. Um, a lot of them were, were solved by uh, simply maintaining a rifle the way a rifle needs to be maintained and uh, improving the materials that were used to, to build the AR. But unfortunately, some you know, horribly tragic stories during the Vietnam War about people that, that were, were caught in battle and uh, their, their guns weren't working, those just tend to stick. So, Sam, we were just talking about the reliability issues or at least the perception of the reliability issues of the M16. What can you talk to or what can you speak Talk a little bit about that when, when it came to uh, researching your article. Yeah, the uh, the AR platform still, in some circles, has kind of a, uh, a reputation, in my opinion, not necessarily warranted uh, for poor reliability. And all of this really stems from early experiences, early experiences in Vietnam um, with early model AR-15s and, uh, well, M-16s especially. Now, the design isn't really inherently flawed in initial testing. Uh, like you would think, you know, if, if there was something wrong with it, wouldn't they have caught that in testing? Well, they didn't because there was nothing wrong with it initially. Uh, the, the rifles functioned flawlessly pretty much in, uh, you know, they had malfunctions that was expected, but they functioned very well in Army and Air Force testing. They proved more reliable and more accurate than the M14, but when they started getting out to soldiers and Marines in the field, they started not working. Why is that? Yeah, what's the problem? What was the problem? Well, there were, there were a few problems. One was that the barrels were not chrome-lined, so they had a bit of a tendency to get rust in the chamber uh, when not properly maintained in the humid jungle conditions. But really the biggest problem was actually, uh, actually stemmed from the ammunition. Now, the rifle and the ammunition were designed together by some of the same engineers on the same team, and they were designed to function correctly together, which they did. But at some point, the uh, Army Ordnance realized that the ammunition was underperforming by about uh, 3% or so. Uh, they were losing about 100 feet per second under what was expected. And so Army Ordnance, not... I guess not realizing or not taking into account that the uh, the ammunition had been designed very deliberately, opted to change the type of propellant that was used. They switched to a different type of gunpowder to produce the desired results in terms of muzzle velocity, but that completely threw the rest of the system out of balance. Uh, it changed the pressure curve uh, that the operating components in the M16 experienced and it deposited this uh, sort of these calcium deposits inside the gas tube, which is really a bad place to get any sort of uh, fouling. And normally that all gets blown out, but this was not the type of powder that was anticipated. So the, uh, the rifle started clogging up and, and choking, and it wasn't a good time. And uh, a lot of soldiers and Marines were killed 
because the rifles were failing when used with unexpected ammunition, basically. Once so they, so they, they, they just to, just to recap. So they adopted this brand new rifle. They sent it out into the field, and yep. they gave people the wrong ammunition. In, in in essence, the rifles worked fine in testing, but as soon as they switched to a different type of gunpowder, the rifles began failing. And then once they corrected the ammunition, everything went okay. So, nope. No. They didn't correct the ammunition. There was this big congressional investigation that produced a very long report. This was a, a huge uh, to-do in the media. It was a big scandal. And the biggest recommendation um, in this report was change back to the original powder. And there were a lot of other recommendations in the report. And the Army followed all the other recommendations except changing the powder back because it was no longer in production. So they switched to yet a different type of powder, which was supposed to be a bit better, uh, some design changes were implemented to the rifles. Um, they added a buffer to slow down the rate of fire so it wouldn't shake itself apart. They, they changed a few other things. They moved to a chrome-lined barrel. But the slight alterations to the design in combination with uh, changing to a new type of powder, which didn't foul as much, um, really worked out all the kinks, and they're pretty reliable now. So back in, if my memory serves, somewhere around 2000 or just after, um, some big changes to the AR platform. Seems like there, there really wasn't a whole lot of changes in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But then in the either the late 90s, early 2000s, they started going with this M4 look where you had a flat top, you had an adjustable uh, stock, and you had a shorter barrel. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? What, what, what are the reasons they, they changed to a – uh, changes so drastically, and, and what's 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 become of it? Yeah, the uh, the sort of M4 uh, craze is a little bit outside the scope of the article uh, because it was supposed to be focusing more on the Marine Corps element, and the Marines didn't uh, didn't start using M4s until much later than the Army. Uh, the M4 comes out of the uh, late '80s, early '90s. Um, designers at Colt had been experimenting with short-barreled M16 derivatives for a very long time. And in 1994, they finally came out with what we call the M4 now. It, it, uh, it's got a shorter barrel. It's got the collapsing stock. Uh, most of them have that flat top upper receiver that you can put your optics on. And so given that you're not losing all that much velocity from uh, a, a shorter barrel, 14.5 inches on the M4, 16 on civilian rifles, and given that 16 inches is the legal minimum in the United States before it's considered a short-barreled rifle, um, a lot of people just find that much handier, and they find the collapsing stock much more comfortable to use. And, of course, people like uh, like attaching stuff to their guns. Now, did, did when the Air Force adopted it, um, did, the, the, did an M16 have the forward assist button? No, the M16 did not have the forward assist initially. The AR-15 was not designed with a forward assist. And in initial testing, no failures were encountered which could have been remedied using a forward assist. A forward assist is a great way to turn a failure to feed into a much more difficult to remedy failure to extract. Um, and when this, uh, when this congressional investigation was underway, Eugene Stern himself was interviewed, um, and he said, no, you don't need a forward assist. If you have a bad round that won't go into battery, just kick it out and load in a new one. But the Army brass were insistent that some kind of device be added to force the bolt closed, in large part due to, get this, and this is actually part of the justification that they listed, they thought that it would have a psychological benefit for soldiers to know that they could force the bolt into battery. Oh, well, that's, well, I, I mean, you know. don't ask me. So do you think we'll ever go? Do you think uh, it's funny that it's such a, a standard? I know some competition guys that have uh, what do they call it? Uh, slick sides. Slick side. They have slick side ARs. Do you think that uh, that will ever go back there? Is there any kind of push to go to get rid of the uh, the, the forward assist or it just kind of hangs out there and nobody cares? Well, uh, a lot of people don't care. A lot of people 
expect it to be there and are upset when it isn't because it's what they're used to. Um, and they, they worry about, oh, well, what if I need to use it, which very rarely happens. I won't say never, but it very rarely makes itself useful. Um, the Air Force AR-15s, even after the forward assist was added to the, um, the, the Army and Marine Corps rifles, the Air Force insisted that they still be left off because that wasn't part of the original design. So you can see these old Air Force rifles that have that, um, that cut out sort of milled off. Uh, but Now, when you were doing your research on the article, did you run across anything? Do you think, uh, do you think the AR platform, the M16 uh, or M4, um, I should say the AR pattern, uh, do you think it's here to stay for a while, or are they looking to change some things, or do you think that they would modify the AR platform in any way, or what are your thoughts? Well, part of why it's been in service so long is because, first off, it was an extremely innovative design when it was new. It was thoroughly modern then as it is today, and it also lends itself very well to reconfiguration into different, uh, you know, different, different configurations for different missions. So you, you walk into a gun store today, I don't know about the ones in California, but the ones out here, oh, and you can you. look up at the rack and no two of these rifles will be the same. All right, cool. Have different parts. So go and to what? Go check out Leatherneck Magazine. Get on the Gun Owners Radio uh, email list, and we'll send out the article. Excellent job, Sam. We'll talk to you next week with some trivia. Thanks very much. All right, folks, subscribe to our podcast. Just search Gun Owners Radio. You'll find us. Leave a five star review to help the word get out, and please support all our great sponsors: San Diego County Gun Owner, U.S. Law Shield, Dillon Law Group, PRMI Mortgage, 365 Glacier Payment. Scott Vincent at Coldwell Banking Realty and National Concealed Carry. I want to thank Michael Schwartz, Laura Schwartz, Sam the Gunman, and our two brothers behind the board, Brendan Thomas and Joe Riddle. Be safe, tune in, tell everybody you know about the show, and we'll be back next Sunday. Bob Siegel's coming up, and I think he's going to show for you that will curl your hair. Right here on FM 961 AM 1170, The Answer. Answer.